Ever since there have been laws, there have been people willing to break them. They say crime doesn't pay, but I mean, it does, at least until you're caught. I'm not saying go out and start committing crimes. Don't do that. History is riddled with people who've descended into a life of crime. Gangsters and mafiosos, thieves, art forgers. What follows is some of their stories. We have all kinds of wacky and wicked ones for you in this episode of Nutty History. Here's the wicked life of criminals around the world. The Book of Swindles Before we get into individual criminals, let's talk about crime in general. There are all kinds of ways to commit crimes. Some of the most ingenious were actually written down by an obscure Chinese writer named Zhang Yingyu, who lived in the Ming Dynasty during the early to mid 1600s. The Book of Swindles is exactly what the title suggests. There are 24 different categories of swindles in the book and 47 stories in total. And these stories are seriously entertaining. Here are some of the chapter titles. A Buddhist monk identifies a cow and his mother. A foiled alchemy scam leads to a poisoning. Check this one out. Coaxing a sister-in-law into adultery to steal oil and meat. And pilfering green cloth by pretending to steal a goose. It's all really good stuff. Yet another story titled Swindling the Salt Commissioner while disguised as Taoist is also pretty good. It goes like this. There was a guy named Tang Yin. He was a talented but scandal riddle scholar who loved streetwalker houses a bit too much. He and his friend Zhu Yuming found themselves running low on funds one day after indulging a bit too much in the seedy underworld of Yangzhou City. To get some more dough, they came up with a plan to swindle the local salt commissioner because that was a job and apparently a pretty lucrative one. I mean, everyone uses salt. So they dressed up as Taoist priests from a temple called the Temple of Ladies Purity and approached the commissioner with a made-up story about needing funds to repair their temple. They were scholars, despite all their debauchery, and they were also poets. They made up some poems on the spot about some stuff around the salt commissioner's office, and the commissioner was impressed. He authorized the withdrawal of 500 ounces of silver from the treasury. Tang and Zhu then traveled over to Wuxing, where they tricked the vice magistrate into handing over the funds by pretending to be envoys of the commissioner. With the swindle money, Tang and Zhu returned to their city lifestyle in Yangzhou and quickly spent it all. The salt commissioner discovered he was duped later, but he was so impressed by the swindle that he never tried to get his money back. The late Ming period, when Ying Yu wrote this book, was going through some pretty rapid economic and social change. The 16th to 17th centuries witnessed a crazy broadening of China's economic reach. Trade was increasing and goods were coming in from all over the world. More goods meant more money and a cash economy developed. Markets were booming and a wealthy merchant class developed. This economic boom, though, also paved the way for all kinds of con artists and fraudsters looking to take advantage. The Book of Swindles is a great time capsule for illustrating how crime and economies often go hand in hand. The Indian Poacher One criminal who might have had the widest array of crimes committed during his lifetime was a guy in India named Kusi Munasami Virapan. His diverse portfolio of illicit activity included poaching, smuggling, abductions, and ending lives. Virapan hid out in the forests of southern India and from there wreaked havoc on police, civilians, elephants, and a three-decade-long crime spree that remains one of the wildest in history. Virapan was born in 1952 in India's Tamil Nadu state. He was up to no good from a young age. He got into poaching and sandalwood smuggling in his early teens, helping his uncle, who was already a well-established poacher. Over the course of his lifetime, Virapan would take out some two to three thousand elephants and sell their ivory tusks for a total worth of nearly three million. He made even more money smuggling sandalwood, a tree prized for its aromatic oil and wood, and protected because it had been over-harvested to the point where it was endangered back in the mid to late 1900s. Virapin was able to get his hands on loads of the stuff, to the tune of $22 million. All that money made gave him the resources to fight against the government, which he thought was restricting his right to poach and smuggle to his heart's desire. He started taking out forest officials who tried to stop him. He planted bombs. He abducted people, including one famous Hollywood star and a prominent politician. He did all this with the most comical facial hair in the history of criminality. It's said that his wife married him mostly for his notoriety and that mustache. Despite his horrible criminal behavior, the villages where Virapan hit out loved him, and he was considered by a lot of people to be kind of a Robin Hood figure. Instead of Nottingham Forest, he had the forests of southern India. Instead of that pointy cap with a feather in it, he had that wild, crazy-looking mustache. Virapan was finally tracked down and taken out by a special task force set up for the sole purpose of finding the notorious smuggler. 
Virapa needed some medical treatment for an eye problem he had, and so the task force set up a decoy ambulance and lured him in. When Virapa realized it was a trick, a fight broke out and he died in the exchange. Big Ear Du Du Yushong, also known as Big Ear Du, also known as the Kingpin of Shanghai, was one of China's most notorious mob bosses. In the 1920s and 30s, he became one of the richest people in all of Asia, but a deal with one of China's leading politicians and revolutionaries took his criminal career to a new bloody heights. When Du was born in 1888, China was going through a maelstrom of change. The last imperial dynasty, the Qing dynasty, was on its way out, and European countries like the UK, US, and France were smelling opportunities. As Du Yushang was growing up and gradually ascending to power in Shanghai, the city was transforming, and a big part of that was because of the presence of foreigners from France, the UK, and the US. These foreigners were called Shanghailanders, and they played a pretty big role in shaping the economic and cultural landscape of the city. Shanghai was quickly becoming an economic hub, and it became divided into a few different concessions, which were controlled by colonial powers. France held one concession, while Britain and the US jointly governed another. These areas were governed under their own laws and regulations, separate from any Chinese authority. Shanghai started being called the envy of Asia, but not for the best reasons. It was home to the region's wealthiest companies. A lack of Chinese legal authority created a kind of wild west, or wild east maybe. Shanghai also lacked a unified immigration system, so it was pretty easy for anyone to just go there and do what they wanted. In short, it was a perfect place for the mob to grow its roots. Du grew up just outside Shanghai, in one of the poorest and most desperate slums in China. It was home to millions of workers who helped maintain Shanghai's economic engine and also all the debauchery that was going on. He had joined up with a notorious green gang led by two other gangsters named Huang Jinrong and Zhang Ziolin. By the mid-1920s, Du was a top boss and the trio ran Shanghai's and China's criminal underworld. It was around this time that Du teamed up with Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the anti-communist nationalist party and the guy who'd go on to become the leader of the Republic of China before a guy named Mao came on the scene and did some unsavory things that we have no time to get into. Chang and Du eventually made a deal. It was straightforward, but it was grim. Du basically funded Chang's political career, and Chang turned a blind eye to Du's criminal enterprises, allowing him to become the sole purveyor of Chinese tobacco, or Big O, or that stuff that helps you chase dragons, however you want to call it. In April of 1927, this alliance culminated in horrible violence in Shanghai. A violent suppression of Communist Party members and other leftists in the city took place. The Green Gang was heavily involved in carrying out the attacks. Thousands of people lost their lives, and the event basically allowed Chiang Kai-shek to seize power. Unfortunately for Du, he liked to get high on his own supply. His addiction eventually led to his death in 1951, after he was exiled following World War II. The Man of a Thousand Faces by the late 1970s, James Madin was France's public enemy number one. Nicknamed the Man of a Thousand Faces because of his many, many disguises, Madin had been robbing banks, offing people, and escaping from prisons for more than a decade. His criminal career took him from France to the Canary Islands, to Switzerland, to Canada, to the United States, to Venezuela, and back to France again. He even kidnapped the very same judge who had sentenced him to prison. The guy was one of the most dangerous and most impressive criminals in history. Marine was a bank robber by trade, and he did it, so he said, to stick it to the big banks and corporations. In the mid-1960s, he joined up with a far-right French paramilitary group that was against the Algerian War of Independence. He left that group and dabbled in legitimate business. He opened a restaurant in the Canary Islands, but that didn't last long. He was soon back in France, robbing stores in France and Switzerland. In 1968, he made his way over to Canada, but he screwed up an abduction of a millionaire woman he was working for as a gardener. So he got 10 years in a Quebec maximum security prison. Now he only served a few weeks before breaking out, then going back with an accomplice and trying to break out the whole prison. The plan failed, but Madin got away. He went on a bank robbing spree through Canada and the US, all the while a master of disguise. It is said he often wore three wigs on his head, one on top of the other so he could do quick changes if the need popped up. There's even a story about how after he robbed a bank, he hailed a taxi and then chatted up the driver while police cars wailed by in the opposite direction. Medin eventually made it back to France via Venezuela, where he continued to rob banks until he was caught in 1973 and got 20 years in France's La Santé maximum security prison. 
a prison most people thought couldn't be escaped from. As he entered the walls of La Sante, Marin was already thinking about escape. An opportunity presented itself when Marin was taken to a courthouse for a separate legal matter. It was there, in the very halls of justice, that his plan unfolded. An accomplice had hidden a revolver in the courthouse toilet, and Marin took a judge hostage, a judge who had sentenced him in the past, and forced his way out of the courthouse. He was caught a few months later, and this time made it into La Sante prison, where he served out a life sentence. Just kidding, that didn't happen. First, he wrote his memoir, titled Death Instinct. Now that sounds like a really bad 80s movie. Then after five years behind bars, he escaped when a weapon and a grappling hook were smuggled in by an accomplice. He was the first person to ever escape from the prison, and he kinda did it twice. A year after his escape, Medin was killed in a fight with authorities. Medin's legacy in France is a tricky one. At the height of his crime spree, he became a regular feature on the front pages of popular magazines like Paris Match. In the features done on him, Mezrin would often be half disguised, smoking cigars holding a Kalashnikov. He cultivated an image of rebel and rogue, a guy who was sticking it to the establishment. His face can still be seen around France, including graffiti and t-shirts with his profile on them. Thanks for watching. What other criminals throughout history do you want to learn about? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more nutty history.